reform, repression or revolution. The future of the Gulf state of Bahrain remains uncertain after 18 months of street protests inspired by the Arab Spring. Some of the most outspoken Bahraini critics of the ruling Khalifa family are behind bars. Violent clashes between police and demonstrators continue. My guest today is Mariam al Khawaja, a prominent human rights campaigner whose father was sentenced to life in prison for plotting to overthrow the government. Who will win the fight for Bahrain's future? Mariam Al Khawaja in Copenhagen, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Let me ask you first why you are in Copenhagen. I know you have dual citizenship, Danish citizenship as well as Bahraini, but why are you there when, as a human rights activist, many people would think you would be fighting the fight in Bahrain itself? Well, of course, there's several ways and several tools that one uses as a human rights defender when it comes to fighting violations in one, one's country. And one of those tools is international advocacy. It's very important to have people on the ground who are documenting the human rights violations and making sure that the outside knows about it. But it's also very important to have people on the outside who can make sure that that information is given to those who can use it to try and preserve human rights in Bahrain and to stop the violations. And so my job is international advocacy, uh, meeting with people who might be able to influence this, the human rights situation in Bahrain. You're a, a, an activist and a campaigner. You're also a daughter. And your father has just been retried on the most serious uh, security charges, found guilty and sentenced again to life in prison. Have you spoken to your father in the last few days? The last time I spoke to my father was about three, four days ago, yes. And he, in the recent past, has conducted a hunger strike. It lasted for more than 100 days because of his treatment uh, and judicial process inside uh, Bahrain's prison system. Now that he has been convicted again and faces the prospect of life in prison, what is he going to do? Well, there is another appeal process, and there's a reason for that. The judicial system in Bahrain is not independent or fair, and it's not really uh, an, a judicial system that we can say holds up the international standards of a fair and independent trial. The reason that they keep uh, allowing appeal processes is because the Bahrain regime understands that by now, if they come out and say that this verdict was the final verdict in this case, that would receive a lot of international attention. Um, and so they keep allowing for an additional appeal process uh, despite it being not part of the judicial system in Bahrain, to buy themselves more time. And so right now I'm still waiting to hear back from the lawyer who will inform us whether my father has decided to go ahead and appeal again um, at the courts for, uh, against the verdict that was issued yesterday or not. He suffered grave injuries um, at the time of his arrest and, and it seems afterwards as well. And we know that he had major surgery on, on his face and his uh, jaw was wired together. How would you describe his physical and his mental health right now? Well, I think mentally he's perfectly well. I, like I said, I spoke to him a few days ago. He's in very high spirits. Um, he understands, and he explains this to me, of course, all the time, that the initial demand of this movement is not you know, the release of the political prisoners or the release of the prisoners of conscience. Rather, that is something that came additionally as a result of the crackdown that came after the initiation of the protests in Bahrain. The initial demands was preserving human rights, institutionalizing human rights, a government that respects human rights. And so for a lot of these political prisoners who are part of this movement, they understand that their presence in prison is not the initial demand of the movement, and they understand that uh, being inside prison is part of the process. And so mentally speaking, he's very strong, uh, and he knows that this is part of the price uh, for preserving human rights in the country. Yeah, you, Physically you, speaking, of course... Go on, sorry, go on. 
Physically speaking, of course, he's still recovering as it was a very long hunger strike, which lasted 110 days. And so it will take a, uh, quite a while before he's fully recovered. But he seems to be doing a lot better. Yeah, you, you say high spirits, but I wonder if he and indeed you have been disappointed by what one can only really call a muted international reaction to the latest court decision on his fate. I mean, we had the United States expressing... Uh, serious disappointment. We had the Danish government, of course, you being a citizen of Denmark there involved, uh, they protested about it. The UN advisory group on an arbitrary detention expressed some words, but frankly it was pretty muted. Are you and he disappointed? Well, I mean, I'm not sure about him himself, as I haven't spoken to him since the verdict came out. But according to, you know, my work internationally for the past year and a half, this is not something that I'm very shocked by. Uh, there has been more or less a muted response towards most of the human rights violations in Bahrain, including extrajudicial killings, sometimes of minors under the age of 18. Um, but I think one of the important things is concrete steps forward. Now, we have seen the Dan parts of the Danish government, the spokesperson for the ruling party in Denmark, come out and talk about uh, initiating a dialogue on sanctions against Bahrain. I think that this is a very, very important step forward, something that is welcomed by the human rights group in Bahrain. Um, and we look forward to seeing what kind of concrete actions will be taken towards stopping the human rights violations in Bahrain. But, of course, um, as... We always say you judge a situation, a human rights situation in any country by looking at the way that, of how they treat their human rights defenders. Currently in Bahrain, the most prominent human rights defenders are in prison. And most likely, if I go back to Bahrain, even if there is no standing warrant for my arrest, I will be uh, either arrested or banned from traveling and so on, which will really put a limit to the amount of work and influence I can have on the outside. And that is why, for the time being, it is better for me to stay abroad and to try to advocate for the human rights situation in Bahrain. Um, not that I'm afraid of going back. I think, you know, sometimes in cer certain countries, the place for any just person or person ri fighting for justice is the prison system. Do you see yourself as a revolutionary? I'm very mindful of something you said way back in March 2011 uh, at the height of the protests in Bahrain, where you referred to your return to the country just a few days before, and you said, I came back after the revolution started. Do you still see yourself as a Bahraini revolutionary? Well, I think we characterize ourselves more specifically as human rights defenders. Um, you know, in countries where you have authoritarian regimes, automatically, as a human rights defender, you're considered one of the worst enemies of the of the government, and so that's it, you automatically become part of the revolutionary process that takes part in these countries. And as such, looking at it from that perspective, I guess yes, we do, uh, we are regarded as being part of the revolutionary process in the country. Yeah, you see, it is important to differentiate between being a human rights campaigner and a revolutionary because if you really see in the end your ultimate goal uh, to be achieved only through the overthrow of the current regime in Bahrain, then it's hardly surprising that the sorts of reforms the Bahraini government has made in the last few months are never going to be acceptable to you because you have made the decision that that regime must go, yes? No, actually, as a human rights organization, our stance has always been very specific and very public. And our stance has always been that as a human rights organization, we do not call for the change of the regime. We do not call for a specific political government. So we don't call for a democracy or a republic or a constitutional monarchy. Our stance is that we're calling for a government that respects human rights, that institutionalizes human rights, and that, you know, grants people their rights as, as citizens of that country. Um, one of the things that we have said, though, is that if the king, the prime minister, and the crown prince of Bahrain are found to be guilty of crimes against humanity or other kinds of human rights violations, then they need to be held accountable. But that should only come in the form of an open, fair, and independent trial according to international but, standards. Right, but if human rights is your prime and really only sole concern, why do, have I not heard warm words of welcome from you and your colleagues for the substantial changes that King Hamad and his team have made in the last few months. I'm thinking, first of all, of the decision to set up the Independent Committee of Inquiry, which, you know, was uh, included outside and respected uh, persons on, on, on the commission. Uh, 
The Economist magazine said no other Arab leaders voluntarily invited such public scrutiny. And since then, we've seen re reforms of the security services, police service reforms, uh, promises that there will be no more uh, of these secret in uh, interrogations behind closed doors with no cameras. I could point to you a whole list of reforms that your government has pledged to make. Well, I mean, I would have to clarify here. First of all, um, as human rights defenders and as the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, I have stated on several occasions that as human rights defenders of Bahrain, we welcome the BICI report, albeit we may have differences with some of the parts of the report. Well, we welcomed it in general. And we hope that that would be a point where, a turning point in Bahrain, where we would see a stopping to the human rights violations. Now, there's a huge difference between making pledges of reform and actually reforming. What we have seen, and we've documented this very well in our post-BICI violations reports, which you can find on our website, that the violations that were mentioned in the BICI report have continued to happen on the ground in Bahrain. So there's a huge difference between, you know, welcoming the recommendations and reports itself, and between saying, well, the Bahrain regime is not actually implementing the very yeah, promises with, that they made Sure, but with respect, it's, uh, with respect, it's not all rhetoric. I mean, we have seen hundreds and hundreds of prisoners released over the last six months. We have seen uh, new powers given given to the lower elected chamber of the Bahraini parliament when it comes to scrutinizing legislation. You know, the, these are real, these are concrete, and for you to dismiss it all as just empty rhetoric is, is surely not acceptable. No, of course. And then we have said that there have been some recommendations that have been implemented, such as setting up cameras in police stations. Now, of course, there's a difference between acknowledging some of the steps forward, but also making a very obvious or making it talking about the recommendations that have not been um, fulfilled. And I think one of the initial things are the recommendations that could have been fulfilled within days, which have not happened. For example, using excessive force against protesters on the streets. That could have happened within days. There just needed to be an order issued from the highest authorities in the country that police were no longer allowed to use excessive force. That has not happened. Accountability, people who have ordered or overseen or participated in acts of violations against against human rights. Again, that has not happened. Even the king's own son, Nasser bin Hamad, there have been several accusations of, uh, and allegations of him being involved in torture. And we haven't seen people being held accountable. So when we're still looking at a situation when the very basic violations that were documented last year are still ongoing, yeah, we, yes, we, we will acknowledge we, some we, of the we, steps we've being forward, but we also need to... We've interviewed a senior member of the Bahraini government and he pointed out, and indeed it seems to be true, that uh, up to 50 different investigations of allegations against security force personnel have been undertaken by the Bahraini government. So it's not as if they're doing nothing. Yes, of course, but the question is how many people have actually been sentenced? How many people have actually been stopped from going to work? The police that were taken to court went in full uniform. They were still on duty. And these are people who are being charged with things like torture. Um, at the same time, you're looking at a situation where the Bahrain government, within 24 hours, can claim that they have caught terrorists, people who were planning all these terrorist activities. But it takes them more than a year and a half to find someone who shot a protester in the back. I really find that hard to believe that they can't find these people who have committed all of these crimes when it comes to people who are serving in the government. But it takes them a matter of hours to figure out which protester threw which Molotov cocktail. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the Molotov cocktails. I mean, would you accept that one of the problems, one of the reasons why the tensions are so high and there is, it seems, so much mistrust in Bahrain right now is because protesters continue to take to the streets with Molotov cocktails, with rocks as well, and attack the security forces. We know at least five members of the security forces have been killed, there continue to be injuries on their side, and would you here and now say that one of the biggest problems is that the demonstrators refuse to adopt non-violent methods? Well, I think, first of all, we have to look at this through context. Um, to begin with, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights has been very specific about um, saying that the protesters need to stay nonviolent, that we do not condone any acts of violence that happen, on, no matter who is committing them. Um, that being said, the situation has to be looked at through context. The five members of the police force that you just mentioned having been killed all happened last year. This year, and since the use of Molotov cocktail started uh, last January, we haven't seen any deaths. Not that that uh, condones the use of violence, but I'm saying that we have to differentiate between the amount of violence that is being 
being used by the Bahraini regime against protesters and protesters who say that they're defending themselves by using things like Molotov cocktails. On the one hand, you have a systematic state-run violence on the streets um, do, being carried out by security forces that belong to the regime. On the other hand, you have small groups of young boys who are using Molotov cocktails and stones because, and as they put it in last January, they said that this was due Where? to the inaction of the international communities towards the human rights violations in Bahrain. Now, so I think there, there's Ma definitely... Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, Mariam Afawaja, but I just, when you use powerful language like that, when you paint images as you've just done, I just, I wonder whether you agree with some prominent politicians and Shia politicians from the Al Wafaq party who in the recent past have said, you know what, despite all the tensions, all the problems we have with the Bahraini government, it is time to talk. Time for a dialogue without preconditions. Hearing you and your characterization of what is happening, it seems to me you don't believe that a dialogue without preconditions would be helpful, do you? Well, as a human rights defender, of course, we're not engaged or, you know, we don't offer a stance on the political dialogues because we are not involved in the politics of the situation. On the, that being said, I think it is very important for the human rights violations to stop first. The, the, uh, the attacks on people on the streets, the nightly raids on people's homes, uh, the torture in unofficial detention centers. Forgive me, but you are, you are making, you are, you are, kind of well, when you say that, you are making a very political statement. When you are saying that the government cannot be taken at face value, when they say that they're not committing the acts that you say they're committing, they cannot be believed, and therefore they cannot be talked to at this moment in time, you are being very, very political. Well, I'm not saying they cannot be talked to. That is something that is up to the political societies, and it's not something that we will engage in because we are not a political society. What I am saying, though, is that as an analysis, if we want the best to come out um, of these talks, we need to see a stop to the human rights violations. That is our only stance. But whether there are political, whether there is a political uh, dialogue or not, that is not our position to say. I mentioned the Shia community, I mentioned the Wafak party. It is clear, is it not, that as the tensions continue in, in Bahrain, and we've described them in some detail, it is becoming more and more sectarian. Would you accept that? Well, I would think that, you know, the, the, the majority of the sectarian tensions that are developing in Bahrain, and this is something I spoke about more than a year ago when I said that if... Uh, as if the international community doesn't move fast enough, then yes, sectarianism will build up in Bahrain as time passes. Uh, but I think the majority of it started with and came from initially from the regime itself. Uh, the fact that the regime carried out a very sectarian crackdown was a message locally and internationally in trying to portray the situation as being sectarian, whereas initially it was not that. Um, of course, the more people are targeted well, because of their sect, you, it is much more likely that people will turn sectarian. Yes, you, you know full well, much better than I, because of the situation your father's in, that the Bahraini government is adamant that uh, senior figures in the activist movement, including your father, have had direct contact, they call it intelligence contact, with agencies working on behalf of Iran. It seems they mean Hezbollah more than anybody else. Is that true? Well, I mean, the, go the regime's own report, the Bahrain Co uh, Independent Commission of Inquiry, found no evidence of Iran being involved in the protest movements uh, in Bahrain. That being said, also, um, my father, for example, Abdul Hadi al and other people who are also involved in that case, are recognized uh, individuals by the international community, by human rights organizations. You know, Human Rights Watch conducted a thorough report of the trial, especially of the Bahrain 13, including my father, which found that all of the, the claims or the charges against these people were made based on um, actions that they had conducted based on freedom of expression, based on um, their, their right to protest and otherwise. Yeah, but there's, it had there's, nothing. With, there were no respect, charges. Okay, but with respect... There's freedom of expression and there's freedom of expression. I mean, Jamal Fakro, for example, a, a senior member of the Shura Council who's been on this program, he claims that there is clear evidence, including video evidence, of Shia clerics in some of the villages which, where most of the unrest has been seen inciting young Shia activists to take to the streets.
Well, of course, first of all, there's a difference. So you were talking about the people within the court case. Within the court case, I would like to see that evidence because so far the government has not been able to provide it. Now, if we're talking about Shia clerics on the streets, it depends on what they're saying. If they're calling for violence, then yes, that is very problematic, and they have to be given a fair and independent trial, something that the judiciary system in Bahrain today does not provide. Second of all, if they're not pr um, calling for violence, if they're actually calling for people to go out and practice their right to protest, then that is not a violation of the law. This is something that is guaranteed by the, the de declarations of human rights internationally. I'd like to ask you about the United States stance in all of this. Uh, we can tell from your voice that you've had some education in the U.S. yourself. You know the U.S. very well. You have contacts there. How disappointed are you with the way the Obama administration has, uh, in a sense, failed to stand up for you, for your Center for Human Rights, and for the um, opposition movement inside Bahrain? Well, I think, you know, there's, um, it's, it's very problematic when we see the kind of double standards that we see coming from places like the United States today. Uh, the United States, because of their fifth fleet, because of Bahrain's geopolitical interest uh, with the United States, we're seeing that um, basically the rhetoric that we're seeing today is that if you're an ally of the West, if you're an ally of the United Kingdom and the United States, then you can get away with human rights violations. Not only can you get away with it because it will not be discussed in the Human Rights Council and the Security Council and otherwise, they will actually continue to sell you arms while you're committing those violations. And this is something very problematic for countries that continue to come out and say that they have a pledge towards these values and human rights um, and democracy, which they continue to, that we continue to see them do today. Let me quote you words from Nabil Rajab, a leading figure in the opposition movement, who of course now is serving his own three-year sentence in Bahrain. He said not long ago, Americans are against democracy in Bahrain now. Do you believe that? Well, I think that for a lot of the people living inside Bahrain, they do see the United States as being involved in the situation right now. Given that the United States has not taken a very consistent, strong stance on the human rights violations, given that they have, there have not been any consequences towards the Bahraini regime for the human rights violations that they continue to commit, um, a lot of people feel that the United States is actually condoning the human rights violations going on in Bahrain. Now, of course, I've spoken to people in the United States and they vehemently stand against that. They say that they are not standing with, they are not condoning the violations, that they would like to see an end to the violations. Yeah. But until we see very, um, very specific actions that, you know, actually put pressure on the Bahraini regime to stop the human rights violations, I think we will continue to see well, a rise in anti-U.S. sentiment inside Bahrain. Briefly, because uh, we're almost at the end, it seems to me, not only have you got this problem in the United States you've identified, you have just been barred from entering to Egypt as well, post-revolutionary Egypt. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, when you look around and you look at the cards that the Bahraini government appears to be holding today, would you accept that there is very little hope of the opposition movement in Bahrain achieving its goals in the foreseeable future? Well, you know, I think that, um, and I don't like calling it the Arab Spring, but um, because that's what it's known as internationally. If we look at the Arab Spring uh, specifically, there were many countries in which where the protest started and people said that it was impossible for them to achieve anything, that the, you know, the dictatorship or the regime at that point was too strong, and yet they were able to achieve. And I think, you know, our work as human rights defenders, mm. we always have to try and, and keep right. that hope, despite it, even if it looks like it's right. very weak. Uh, so we'll continue to work towards that. Mm? All right. Mary, I'm sorry to end it there, but we are out of time. Thanks for joining us on Hard Talk. Thank you. My pleasure.